Welcome back to the McCann Dogs podcast. This is episode 50, and I'm pretty jazzed about it. I know who uh, joining me as always is uh, the director of online training, Shannon Viljasso, and uh, thanks for joining us, Shannon. Hey, thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Uh, I wouldn't, I, I, I'm actually really pumped to make it to episode 50. I know we have tons of good uh, content coming up that we're going to be recording. But when we first started doing our podcast, I, uh, you know, I didn't really know what to expect. I just thought it would be fun to sit down and have a conversation every week about, you know, some aspect of dogs learning or dogs in general or, or dog training. Uh, so I, I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty excited to, to be at episode 50 already. Me too. Now today's uh, episode, episode 50, is going to be uh, called uh, all about uh, um, uh, a blog post that Shannon has written, and it's called Why Ignoring Bad Behaviors Won't Work, and, and we're going to dive into uh, some of the why uh, behind uh, the McCann Method and some of the reasons why uh, you know we have managed to help so many dogs over the years, and I think Shannon's uh, done a really, really great job at um, you know cr creating an article that um, covers all aspects of dogs' learning, um, so if you're interested in reading what Shannon has written, I'll post a link to the article in the show notes uh, of this. If you're watching this on our YouTube podcast, it will be in the description and you can definitely check that out. But with no further ado, I'd like to, to jump into this uh, topic. And uh, this episode call is called Why Ignoring Bad Behaviors Won't Work. I'm Ken Steep and welcome back to McCann Dogs. <laughs> Now, Shannon, this is something that we uh, often talk about, um, sort of the idea of this is something we often talk about when it comes to, uh, you know, people's understanding of training and understanding of uh, how dogs learn. Um, and I'd love to know just where this idea for the article came from for you. Yeah, so this one, I've actually recently come across a couple of memes and an article on Facebook that talked about this idea that um, if you're when you're training your dog, that you should re reinforce and reward heavily with the behaviors that you like, which I could not agree with more. But it uh, it's also starting to be said a lot out there in the dog training community that you should ignore bad behaviors. And that I could not disagree with more. And, and I thought it was time to sit down and put some thoughts down about why ignoring those bad behaviors is not going to work and what you can do instead and, and sort of um, demystifying the idea that we can only praise and reward when our dogs are doing the things that we like. And the rest of the time we should, you know, somehow magically ignore that behavior and pretend it doesn't exist. And that is going to set you up for a bit of a struggle with your dog. So um, I think I, uh, I tried to simplify things as much as possible by putting things into sort of three main categories of ways of thinking. And I think we'll, we'll touch on those through this podcast today. We know that uh, dog training in general has changed dramatically over the years. And uh, I think back uh, to conversations I've had with Marty and Deb McCann, the founders of McCann Professional Dog Trainers. You know, when they left their training club, they left to do something that was a little bit different and was sort of seen as unusual or atypical when they started to use food in training. And over the years, uh, you know, using food in training has become a much more popular thing. You mentioned in your article that uh, over the years we've become a much be, we've become much kinder as trainers and I think that's a really valuable thing to remember absolutely and I think we should never lose sight of the fact that we should always be striving to be the best possible trainers we can and that means looking at methods critically and thinking you know can I do this in a different way how can I do this more efficiently how can I do this with um, with the idea in mind that my dog needs to enjoy this situation as well, but still maintaining the focus of getting the dog trained. At the end of the day, you know, it, it can't all be about the methods. It's got to be about the fact that we have these creatures in our care and it's our responsibility to keep them safe and it's our responsibility to give them a really good quality of life. And that's, it's the same idea with our kids. You know, you can't, you see the science and you see the, the theories and, and learning theories change over the years with kids and with dogs and with just about everything. And you see the ebbs and flows. You know, we were in a generation a little while ago where every kid was supposed to get a trophy just for showing up so that we didn't wound their self-esteem. And now this generation is saying that that's creating 
created, you know, a whole lot of entitlement and moving forward, they're making different methods for this generation. And it's the same thing with dog training. I think one of our big benefits is that we have been around long enough to have seen trends come and go. And we've seen and tried all sorts of different methods. And we've, we've got enough experience and we've got enough hands in on enough different types of dogs and temperaments of dogs to know that you need to figure out what's going to work for that individual dog. There's no one fail-safe method that is going to work for every dog across the board. And what experience tells us is that we have this giant toolkit at our disposal of things that we've collected over the years, you know, since 1982. That is a long time ago now. And we can dip into that toolkit and use whatever tools we need to make that dog's life better and to make our dog, our lives with those dogs better as well. So we want to make sure that we always keep in mind that we're moving forward and making progress, but we can't simply lump ourselves into one method of training that is, you know, only going to reward good behavior and ignore everything else because that's not going to get the job done either. And then you end up in a situation where you're frustrated, your dog's frustrated, you can't afford them freedom, you can't let them off leash because they don't listen or they become a danger to those around them. So while we always want to make sure that we're moving forward with our methods, we also need to keep sight of the fact that we want results. At the end of the day, we want the whole point of training is to have dogs that listen, that we can give a better quality of life because we can give them more freedom. One of the real advantages is that I think we have, and, and certainly one of the advantages that I had becoming a dog trainer and learning to become a dog trainer are the amount of dogs that we get to help every single week. You know, uh, more than 500 dogs every single week come to us to, uh, you know, learn new skills and their their uh, owners learn, you know, how to become a better dog trainer for their dog. And I've heard the saying before, you know, I, I, I train the dog that I'm training. N knowing full well Absolutely. that we very specifically our work every dog is unique there are, there are no two dogs who are exactly alike so we need to modify you know you know how we teach them these skills or spend a little bit more time in one um, aspect or you know of their training to make them uh, reliable and to keep them safe and i think that's so important now you, you mentioned a little bit earlier talking about uh, a comparison with people and kids and uh we often talk about how uh you know dogs aren't small children but i see you mentioned that in the article and, and talk about that for a moment yeah, absolutely. I always want to create some sort of an analogy so that I can try to put things in perspective and try to explain things as well as I can. And um, I know I've written a lot of articles lately about the fact that dogs are not fur kids. They're not humans because that's that's really the way things are, are sort of evolving in the dog world is people are starting to think of them as small children and it's, it's to our detriment and it's to our dog's detriment. So um, as a, a bit of a, a nod to that, that idea, I did say, um, let's put this in human perspective. And then hopefully you're not actually thinking of your dogs as little humans. And if you tried to call me out on that idea that I said, let's think about this in human perspective, good job. Thank you. And you get an A plus, but I did want to make an analogy so that people could sort of try to think about the idea of what, um, what the perspective I was trying to put on the idea that just ignoring bad behavior is not a good idea. And I think it's a real disservice to our dogs, you know, knowing um, w how they uh, feel gratified and rewarded, knowing what their requirements are. It's a real disservice to our dogs if we treat them like children, you know, they have, who have dramatically different needs, wants, and, and desires. Now, we, you and I often talk about the fact, and we talk about it on our YouTube channels and, uh, you know, all of our social outlets, dogs will do what's rewarding. And uh, we know that learning what your dog finds rewarding for in your specific training scenario is so important. And t let's talk a little bit about, you know, how, how knowing what dogs do, uh, dogs will do what's rewarding can impact how you approach your dog training. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think it a lot of it boils down to the innately rewarding behaviors that your dogs have. So for example, eating is usually an innately rewarding behavior for most dogs. It's it's a pretty um, pretty reliable thing that you can offer a dog food and they will probably eagerly eat it. There's definitely dogs out there that are not super motivated by food and there's things that you can do to help motivate them with food or help to increase their food motivation. But most dogs innately, they just, they come out of the box 
wanting food. You know, I, I joke around a lot that my dogs seem to come right out of the box wanting tennis balls as well. I don't know how they, they decide that these little round objects are the magical orb of joy before they've really even had experience with them. But um, for the most part, through, through nature, we can find that food, rest, safety, sex, all of those things are going to be innately rewarding things for a dog. And we can use some of those things to reinforce what we like. But the in the idea that we can't ignore bad behaviors, we need to think about what the dog is doing that's rewarding to them in that moment. And those innate rewards are going to be just a given that they're going to work against you if you don't try to control them a little bit. So um, I use the analogy of us speeding. So as an example, if cops decided that they were going to try to try a new tactic and instead of pulling you over when you're speeding and giving you a ticket, they only pull you over when you're driving the speed limit and either praise you or hand you some arbitrary amount of money. And that might work for some people. There are some people who don't enjoy speeding. They don't have this innate desire to speed and they don't have a rush that comes along with speeding. But there's lots of people in this world and, you know, just, just drive around the block and you'll probably meet some. There's lots of people that love to put that foot into the pedal and they love to go fast and it's innately rewarding for them to do so. So that person that loves going fast, there's probably no reward in the world that's going to top that. So ignoring the fact that they're going fast is never going to stop that person from speeding. You need to have something that is going to suppress that behavior. You need you need to have something of a negative consequence for that behavior, which is why, you know, those people probably will slow down a little bit if they get a massive speeding ticket and it takes money out of their bank account. But simply the promise of being pulled over and being given money or being praised for not doing something is never going to work for that person. So I tried to use that analogy with dogs. If, for example, you have a situation where there's food on the floor, the dog is innately going to want that food and simply rewarding them for ignoring that food is probably not going to work because they will have already likely gotten the food. So not only do you need to reward them for ignoring the food, if that's the expectation, but you also need to stop them from being able to get the food as well. And if they understand the rules clearly and they go for that food when they shouldn't, there needs to be a bit of a consequence for doing that so that you can override that innate reward that they're going to have. I think food is um, such a valuable tool, um, you, you know, for, for training your dog. It's something that we often um, chat about with some of our students if they say, well, geez, I'm, my dog doesn't really like to use food in training or they're just not that motivated by it as we'll ask them, you know, how much access do they have to food? Um, sometimes meal feeding rather than just free feeding where the food is always down. If the, if the student chooses to meal feed their dog, they are going to have a dog that really under, uh, understands that food is a valuable resource. I mean, out of the, out of the, the box from the very beginning, dogs ha understand that food is a valuable resource. So really to, um, you know, continue that, continue their understanding that if this is something worth working for is a really helpful thing. Uh, another thing that I sort of was thinking about as you were talking about um, the idea of, of getting a ticket is uh, it, it's sort of, I guess, on the other side of things, but rewarding your dog for a reason having a reason to give them that food reward rather than just, you know, stuffing food in their face every, for, you know, for uh, all the time without uh, any effort put forward will really uh, teach them that, uh, y you know, that they don't have to work very hard, that they don't have to pay attention to you, for example, and uh, food, uh, you know, a slice of pizza in my case would just appear in front of my face that they're putting any effort in. And I think that's really important. Now, when you talked about, um, having food on the floor and uh, seeing whether or not your dog chooses to reinforce themselves by eating it. We know that some behaviors, and I'm thinking uh, specifically about uh, like counter surfing is a good one, talking about self-rewarding. Once a dog has self-rewarded and learns that there's something really valuable up on that counter, they're much more likely to do it again. Absolutely. And and what, what happens is a reinforcement history gets created. And sometimes it's a very light bit of information and sometimes it's an extremely heavy bit of information for the dog. Meaning if, um, if they get something, if they jump up on the counter and they steal a half a chicken, 
that is going to be an incredibly reinforcing thing for the dog. And it's going to create an immense reinforcement history in their brain where they are going to try again and again and again and again because it paid off so well. It might not be as exciting if they jump up on the counter and steal a crouton that got left on the counter. Yes, it will create reinforcement history, but not as strongly. But even in that situation where they've gotten the crouton, that one event learning could be enough for that dog to try again and again. Every time they pass by the counter, they're going to investigate, oh, is there another crouton up there or something interesting? The dog who's eaten the chicken is definitely going to be on the outlook for whatever they can find in the kitchen. So what you need to do, it's, it's threefold to teach your dog any specific bit of information. You need to make sure that you are teaching them what the expectation is. You need to manage the environment so that they can't get into mischief in the meantime. And then you need to have a set of consequences that you've decided on if your dog decides to do something regardless of the rules that are in place. So if they make a mistake. And I think what people get confused about when we talk about consequences in dog training is they think it has to be something rough and harsh and hard. And it doesn't. I've, I've written many articles on meaningful consequences and meaningful rewards. And it simply has to be something that makes the dog take notice and sets you up so that you can have a bit of success. And you can go back to part A of the equation and continue to teach your dog what you'd like to do with those other two things on the sidelines, the management and the ability to say no on the sidelines to back yourself up. So in that situation where they're counter surfing, for example, if your dog has access to the kitchen and you're not there to watch, there's a chance they're going to jump up on the counter. If they know the rules of the house already, if you've done your due diligence and you've taught them jumping up on the counter is not an acceptable thing, then they're at a point where they can probably have free access to the kitchen because they understand already jumping up on the counter is not acceptable. Therefore, I'm not even going to think about it. It's not an option for me. And we can live harmoniously so we can cut down on the management aspect of things. But especially with a young dog, what you need to make sure of is that you're controlling those resources. You're controlling controlling those, uh, those areas or those avenues where your dog might investigate and make a poor choice and end up jumping on the counter and being self-reinforced. So it's always that there's multiple parts to the equation. And if you cut out any part of the equation, you're going to end up in a situation where you're creating frustration and you're creating confusion. And of course, the end result of the trained dog is not going to be on the table for you. I think, um, I immediately think of uh, when you get back to counter surfing, I think about how we are going to set ourselves or set our dogs up to be right. You know, we are going to work through the training. Um, we're going to have a house line on them. For example, when you talked about the consequences, uh, may maybe in the very beginning stages, there's an empty countertop and you have your dog's house line on and you've just got a foot on that house line so that your dog uh, isn't able to jump up and self reward. Giving them that opportunity to choose is such a valuable part of their learning but you do need a way to say no. And I know you and I um, uh, don't love the uh, word using the word no. We'd love to give our dog more specific information, leave it off specific things. But the idea of no in general is is really important when it comes to a dog's learning. And uh, uh, in your article, you talk about th that there's many ways that you can say no with your dog. Absolutely. And and there's no one size fits all answer for this. I can't say this is how you say no to your dog because there's so many variables in the situation. You know, I, I've used several analogies throughout the article and there might be a situation where you've got a guest coming over and you want your dog to not be jumping on your guests. So it, that might be a situation where you say no by taking your dog and having them go and lie down on a bed in the corner because that is contrary to the their ability to jump up. They're not going to be able to jump up if they're laying down politely in the corner. You know, things like that. That's a way of saying, no, if my dog is harassing my guest, I can remove them from the situation. If my dog is jumping on my guest, I might use a little pop off words, off downwards with the leash so that I tell my dog, this is not an acceptable thing to do. And again, it's not, it doesn't have to be harsh. So it doesn't have to be this huge correction. Dogs are not, they're, most of them are not hard headed. Even the ones that people say are stubborn and it's usually because there's confusion there, not 
not this desire to be stubborn. So a little bit of a, a pop downwards on the leash is not going to do anything to harm the dog, but it's going to give them solid information on the opposite side of things where you're taking that reward of them jumping up on the person and you're removing the reinforcement value for the dog by saying, this is not fun anymore. You're not allowed to jump up. Even if you just physically gently remove the dog, you're still saying no in that scenario. So that no is such an important part of things. I can't even imagine life if all we got was praised for doing the things that we were doing right and the rest of the time we were left to flounder because we nobody wanted to tell us no we would be so frustrated in life because there's so many variables you know in that situation where my dog is jumping up he might think it's the person themselves they're not supposed to go and visit if i don't say no or you know it, it, there's going to be this general shroud of confusion for my dog if i don't give him a good clear bit of information of what's acceptable and what's not so with in conjunction with that little pop downwards i'm now going to tell my dog what he should do as well. I'm going to make sure that I reinforce the other half of the equation. I might work a sit because again, my dog can't jump up if he's sitting politely. But in the perfect world, I would set myself up so that I had the management component in between those two things. And I gave my dog an opportunity to first be right. And I stopped him from the opportunity to be wrong in that scenario. So in the example of jumping up, we always teach our dogs to greet politely by sitting first. This is just something that makes life easier to transition to a dog that can go up to people and say hello politely without jumping up. So it's a good, clear, concrete way of saying this is how you how you greet people. And as my dog is sitting, if he is being greeted by the person, which presumably this is a friendly dog we're talking about, he wanted to say hello to begin with, the person is greeting my dog, so he's enjoying that greeting. And I'm also telling him what a good dog he is by saying, yes, giving him cookies, that is a twofold way of, it's a very win-win situation for him. It tells him he's right for not jumping on the person, he's right for holding the sit, and of course this wonderful reward of the person saying hello is also feeding that innate desire to be in re reinforced as well. So that's part one of the equation. I love that um, when you do give him clear your dog clear information, if they were to jump up and you guide them back down, and you can start, you can get back to rewarding them sooner. You know, it, 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 they very clearly made the mistake. Now in your mind, you know, okay, uh, we need to work through this uh, thing. Um, and then you can set yourself up to be a great leader for your dog rather than them just to explore all these opportunities and options in the world. I, I think that's such, such valuable and such remark you know it's across the board it's good information i can think of all of the thousands of dogs that i've had the opportunity to uh, be around and work with and uh, all of them can benefit from that clear uh, great leadership now when you talk about in your article about some steps to being a clear dog trainer or some clear dog training what 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 might our listeners take away from this it, it, you know maybe a list of uh, steps that they can sort of uh, focus on when they're trying to be a clear leader and a great trainer for their dogs yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost is always be fair to the dog. You can't put them in situations that are going to be overwhelming for them or over their head, over their capability of understanding and expect them to make good choices. So for example, if I have a five month old puppy, I'm not leaving that dog loose in the kitchen, whether there's food on the counter or not. I'm not leaving that dog loose in a situation where he might try to investigate. And the thing with innate rewards is they're going to be individual for each dog. And some dogs, all it takes is them investigating, jumping up on that counter for them to feel reinforced. So they were able to get up there, they've sniffed a little bit. That can be a huge reward for some dogs. So what you need to do is make sure that your dog doesn't have access to the ability to make mistakes when you don't have the ability to reinforce and train. So for example, with the counter surfing, I would always make sure if I'm going to take a shower, my dog either comes with me and they've got something to do um, on the bathroom floor or I'll put them in the crate. You know, I, I, people say all the time, well, I just stepped out of the room for a second. I just went to go to the bathroom and the dog did this. I just left for a second. I was watching him and then I just looked away for a second. That's all it takes, right? It It, it is... It is the situation that we have created is that ability to be inattentive and then expect the dog to make the right choices before they've been schooled enough 
to make those right choices. So I need to make sure that I manage the situation well while I'm waiting to teach the lessons. Now, with that same five-month-old puppy, at the same time, I'm probably working on all sorts of exercises to keep him from being interested in the counter and keep him from figuring out that jumping up on the counter sometimes bears fruit. So that's the teaching aspect of things. And that's the most important part of expecting a dog to have good manners, have good rules, and listen, is spending enough time teaching that particular dog and getting to the end results with that particular dog before testing it. So I am going to make sure that I'm working all sorts of exercises in the kitchen when I can. And then when I can't be there and I can't be attentive to my dog, I'm going to manage him by either putting him in the crate or bringing him with me and making sure he doesn't have access to those means of getting into trouble. And then my third step, sorry, go ahead. Uh, well, I think that um, keeping in mind that uh, you, you training your puppy mustn't be an afterthought. You know, that has to be sort of top of mind when your puppy has freedom to be a great manager for them, to uh, be prepared to intervene if they make a bad mistake, but most importantly, being there to reinforce the good choices. You know, it's sort of like this, uh, this pairing of uh, letting them make choices and rewarding the good ones and then showing them how to be right. If they do make a bad choice and you have your, your house line, for example, on, um, to redirect them or guide them away or train through it or whatever. You must, we do often hear, uh, I, I, he was just alone for two minutes. I went out to the car, out to the end of the driveway to go get my wallet. And I came back in and my sh half of my shoe was missing. But I think, uh, you know, uh, the training aspect, giving your, being, a, being a, a great teacher and leader for your puppy must be top of mind. Absolutely. 100%. We always want to set them up for success. Always. For sure. Now, what are some of the other um, steps that you would give our listeners to be a great trainer for their dog? Yeah. So teaching is always first and foremost. And then management is so important in the interim. And we talk a lot about management and that's because it is so crucial. If I allow my dog to do whatever he wants when I'm not actually training, I'm setting myself up to create those that, that history of reinforcement in him that's going to work against me. And it's going to add to his innate rewards and his innate reinforcement if I allow him to do things like, you know, ignore me on a recall because I'm not in training mode and go and chase the squirrel or you know if I call him three or four times when he's out in the backyard and he's wandering around doing his own thing and I just let that happen I'm creating a situation where I'm actually making my life more difficult and I'm creating frustration in my dog because they're not going to understand then when I come back down the road to say no you're not allowed to do that well, how is that fair? I was allowed to do it before. So that that first step of teaching is so important in conjunction with the second step of managing the scenario and managing the dog so that they're getting the right information and very little opportunity to self-reward and make the wrong choices. The, and, you know, for our listeners, you, we can't overstate that enough you know, setting them up so that we don't have to say no, setting them up so that we don't have to interrupt uh, is that is probably a greater effort than the actual training uh, of your puppy. Because in the perfect training scenario and environment, you are completely in control. You know, you, you are able to uh, work through specific exercises. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about the jumping up on a countertop. We, we did a video recently on our YouTube channel where um, I got a piece of cheese and stuck it to the edge of the counter. And I'd already worked through uh, a few uh, progressions of teaching the, uh, that dog not to jump on the countertop, but I was absolutely prepared for her to make a, a, a bad uh, make a mistake, make a bad choice. Uh, I went into it uh, with a, the training mindset and um, the preparation uh, of it took me, you know, several, several minutes and the actual skill took me, you know, eight, 10, 12 repetitions, which was just a couple of minutes. So, you know, um, management is so vitally important with all of the, um, the students that we chat with and when people uh, run into some uh, issue that they could have never expected at home, well, you can set some of these things up to train through them, which can be so advantageous. Definitely. I, I do the setup all the time. I find it so, so valuable because then I'm prepared, right? And I tend to be a little bit too over analytical with things when they happen in real time and I'm not prepared. I will stop and think far too much about it. Um, I've gotten a lot better over the years at, re at simply reacting and following through and trusting my instincts. But there's a lot of times where I, I have to sit back and actually think, and then go forward. So I love the setup because it takes that process 
it, it shrinks that process down and makes it much, much quicker. If I say, okay, I'm going to go and work on counter surfing today. I've got this dog I'm working with. I've got my leash on, you know, maybe I have tucked a nice loose lead under my foot so that as I'm working with things on the counter, if my dog does try to jump up there, he gets a little self-correction. So he's just going to connect with the leash as he jumps up, but I'm not actually tethering him to the floor. So he can't feel that that leash is holding him down and he can make a choice. And if he goes to jump up and he gets that little, you know, five or six inches inches up and then gets a, a quick check on the leash, eventually, you know, after one or two times, he's probably going to say, hmm, that didn't work. And then once he, his uh, little light bulb goes on and he says, oh, okay, I'm not jumping up, all four feet are on the floor. That's the point where I'm going to reward that dog. I'm going to let him know that is a better choice. What a good dog. And I basically covered all three of my scenarios right there. I've done the teaching, I've done the management, and I've done the, uh, the saying no all in that one nice, neat little step. And my dog has been reinforced on several levels and he has learned through that cycle that this is wrong, this is right. And if I repeat this behavior, it's gonna be reinforced. Hopefully what I can do is I can override that innate reward of the food being on the counter and being excited, exciting. And eventually that history of reinforcement that I've created is going to work to both of our advantages. So my dog will learn what he should do and I will have a dog that understands what he should do. I think you made a really important point that I want to point out to our listeners that uh, when you talked about having your foot on the leash, that the, there was no tension on that leash. It's really important that we give our dogs that opportunity to feel like they are free to choose, that they aren't being held in position. And whether that comes to, uh, you know, uh, sitting on a loose leash, a meet and great example, walking on a loose leash you know, having more freedom on a long line, uh, I, all, all aspects of, of your training, it's really uh, hypercritical for your dog to feel like they have an opportunity to make a choice here uh, by being on a loose leash. You, sometimes we hear of people who say like, oh, he knows as soon as the leash goes on, he knows. And that's likely because of the information that your dog has gotten that, you know, being on a leash means they don't have to do as much thinking, that they, you know, don't have to listen because they're going to be guided or held or whatever. So it's, it's, uh, it's really valuable to be, you know, it's really self-aware when you're uh, working with a young dog, uh, whether it's jumping up or whatever the thing is that, uh, that your dog feels like they are free to choose. Yeah, and you'll hear us talking ad nauseum about a house line or having a leash on a puppy all the time. And we always talk about having them drag a leash. And that is because we don't want to use it to physically manipulate the puppy because eventually our goal is to be able to take the dog off leash and have the exact same behavior as when we had that little safety net of the leash on. So having a loose lead just helps to simulate that off-leash situation so much for the dog. And it sets you up for the dog actually learning how to tune in and listen for your cues. Whereas, you know, as you said, if that leash is tight, they tune out a lot of the times. And it's a really interesting thing because they know that you've got them. They don't really have to think through things. They can just put their head down and do whatever it is they want. Whereas if they're off leash and they've learned that they need to look to you for information and guidance, you're going to have a situation where they're, they're, they've always got that idea in their head and they're always thinking about it. So it's very easy to get their attention at that point. But if they've gotten used to leaning into that tight leash and they've gotten used to that feeling, that makes life a lot more difficult. And when we talk about choices, uh, you know, just to sort of reiterate, it is really important that we uh, do give our dogs the appropriate information that they make a great choice, that they're rewarded. If they make the wrong choice, then there is a consequence appropriate to the dog, but then it we, we uh, you know, are able to show them how to be right. You know, that's really what we want to do here. We always want them to be choosing the right thing. Absolutely. Now, we... Um, are going to every week do a uh, question. We'll do a question and answer from one of our listeners uh, or, or you know, members of our Facebook uh, page. Uh, and do we have a uh, question lined up for today? Uh, yeah, we do. So I've got. There we go. We've got a question from Sue, and I'm sorry, I'm probably not going to say this right. Mula Meester. She says, my dogs know leave it in the house, but out on our walks on our farm, they eat whatever it is they find, no matter what I say. If I run towards them to intervene, they eat faster. What should I be doing differently? So it sounds like to me, Sue, what has happened here is the dogs have learned that dogs being very situational, they do not generalize like we do. So in the house, that dog may have learned 
beautifully to leave things on cue, but out and about in the real world, they've learned the exact opposite of that. They've learned that they're free and they can grab that thing and they can chow it down faster. And by the time you get to them, that innate reward has been fulfilled. So basically, this is probably not the answer you're going to want, but it needs to it needs to be trained a little bit backwards in your world. So you need to go back to stripping a little bit of freedom from those dogs and reteaching the leave it cue in the outdoor environment. So the same idea as what you did inside, you know, whatever method you use to teach the leave it cue inside, and we use a combination of choice and um, and saying no when the time when the time is necessary to say no. So I will teach my dogs leave it with a lot of reinforcement for them making the right choice. But I also make sure when they're young dogs, they're out and about, they're on long lines until I know that they will listen to my voice and you know from how however far away I am, I can say, leave it and call them back to me. They are never free to be in that position where they can chow it down quicker as I go running to them in a mad rush because who knows what they might pick up. It's such a dangerous thing for them. So you're going to have to go back in your training and with your walks, go back to having a long line on. You know, you can get a 20 or a 30 foot long line and just let them drag that as long as you're able to see them and they're not getting caught on anything. That's going to be a safe scenario. Um, a side note, people often ask about flexi leashes or about uh, retractable leashes. I do not recommend them for this sort of work because that tension, what we were just talking about with the tight, lo tight leash, loose leash, um, that tension on the flexi, it's like a big flashing neon sign that says you're on leash, I've got control. And then of course, when you take that off, that sensation is gone and dogs become very wise to that. So what we need to do is have that long line there so that as soon as the dog goes for something they shouldn't, you can say leave it and you can back yourself up if the dog doesn't listen. You're not not, you're not putting yourself in a situation where now you have to bridge the gap and try to run to them and try to wrestle it out of their mouths. I can guarantee you, even if you get lucky and that works a time or two, eventually they're going to figure out they're faster than you. They can wolf it down faster than you. You need to go back to a situation where management comes into play and you can physically contain the dog. You can physically get control of the dog and you can stop them by saying no in that scenario you can stop them from trying to get it down before you get to them so a little bit of work it's going to take but uh but time will tell the other thing i like to mention about long lines is um if you get a 20 foot long line for example don't just train through on the 20 foot long line and then take the line off and think oh great my dog's trained now take the 20 foot long line Put on a 10 foot long line, put on a five foot long line, put on a three foot long line, you know, work it out so that you're just gradually coming off and weaning off of that long line so that your dog still has the opportunity to be reinforced one way or the other with the decisions they make. It reminds me a little bit of last week's podcast when we talked about, um, is your dog easily distracted? Great. Well, here's why. Well, now Sue knows exactly what uh, her dog finds extremely valuable and she's able to go out and train through it. It's funny how uh, this question sort of wraps up a lot of what we were talking about today with, um, you know, conflicting reinforcements and things like that. If your dog, she's going to have a little bit of work to do now that her dog knows that, uh, you know, is it he uh, that, or I guess both uh, can eat much faster than Sue can run and uh yes. <laughs> they find you know eating those things that they find out in a around her yard to be pretty um tasty or at least uh, rewarding to consume so um this is I, I think it's a great transition and sort of nicely sums up all of uh, what we've discussed today now if you're uh, listening to our podcast and you're thinking you know i have a problem similar to sue's but uh, i also have this other problem or or i i would love to be able to work through this specific issue then you can always join shannon and i in uh the my dog can online training program and shannon if you just have a, you know a couple a, a, a few sentences about what we offer in the My Dog Can program. Yeah, absolutely. We teach the dogs to come when they're called, walk nicely on leash with you, and we work on sit and down stays as well. It is an eight-week training program that you get access to for four months and uh, great support from the McCann staff. So Ken and myself are, are active in our Facebook group all the time. You can send us individual emails if you have questions, or of course, you can post in Facebook. You can call us. You can send video. There's all sorts of ways of making sure that the lessons that you're learning in the My Dog Ken program are supported well by us. It's a 
fantastic program. You can take the first lesson for free. Take the uh, first lesson for recall, walking on lead, and stays. And I guarantee you, you'll see results in those first uh, those first lessons, and you'll be addicted and wanting more. And you get to hang out with our amazing uh, My Dog Can community w and get to share in some of their successes and share your own successes. So, um, you know, I love seeing that in the community. So um, I will drop a link in the show notes below. If you're watching this on the YouTube podcast, I will drop a link in the description below. And if this is your first time on our YouTube channel, I want to thank you for watching. We publish new episodes every single week to help you understand the why blind dogs think and learn. And on that note, I'm Ken. This is Shannon. Happy trading.